Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all taught illustration at universities. We've all published with all the major publishers. And we've got something like 40, 50, 60, 70 books to our names. It always changes. Mm Mm-hmm. That is correct. Each week, we pick a different topic in illustration. We take questions from fancy people like you. Can I call? Can I call our listeners fancy? I don't fancy. know where that came from. <laughs> I don't know if illustrators really are fancy, but fancy listeners their hot dogs like you. With gray <laughs> We've got the fanciest audience um, uh, out there. So we answer questions from you guys about illustration, typically. And, uh, and we just knock it out of the park. We give you new information that you never, never considered on your own. And we're extremely Sometimes, sassy today. Yeah. Yeah. Because we just, we're, all, we're ornery because we're, Sometimes we fight, sometimes we agree. <laughs> Each time you're going to learn something new. This time we're going to fight though, because we've been recording all day and, uh, right. Yeah, and for, we're, for we're our, just our we're mad. Class, we're yeah. mad at each other. We're taking it out on each other now. The our, yeah. our lectures now are basically us <laughs> just arguing. <laughs> so, uh, anybody get uh, scammed since our last episode, or you've been able to watch out for for scams? Uh, I scam the scammers. That's good. I've been watching the YouTube. Uh, uh, dude who does that and somehow he can call in i don't know how he gains access to their screen but he's just del- while he's talking to him he's just deleting files of theirs what? boom 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 it's coming what? off and then eventually during the call they realize that this is happening and it, I'll, I'll include a link in the show notes if you guys uh want to see it um it's it's It takes it just you got to be in a certain mood to watch one. It takes like fifteen minutes, but by the end, you're just so great because it's it's that classic feeling of the bully getting beat up, you know, (laughs) justice and uh, justice is served for sure. Um, So I'll include a link. But anyway, uh, so it's fun. It's fun to watch somebody scam the scammer, scam the grift the grifter. Okay, question number one: How do you stay in the biz? This this comes from Jonathan. It's not how do you get in to the biz? How do you actually stay in the biz? So um, he says, my question is, once you've broken into the industry, how do you stay in? How do you line up consistent work and maintain a career? I am an illustrator and I've worked mainly in comic books. I've been published since 2011 and even signed an exclusivity contract with one of the big two in 2014. That means um, Marvel or DC. And essentially a contract saying, I won't go and work for DC because I'm doing you know, Marvel characters. Um, Now, none of this is bragging because at the end of my contract, the company thanked me and I've not worked with them since. To be fair, during my time with this company, my style evolved to become more painterly than it was at the beginning. But there were no negative notes on this while I was working. Could this stylistic shift be to blame for a lack of work? Am I secretly difficult to work with and no one told me? I maintain my editorial connections. I keep them up to date. The response to my work is always positive, but followed by some variation of, we just have to find the right project to work on together. I've been self-publishing and crowdfunding the last few years, which is great, but a tough way to make a living. I've begun reaching out to more book editors and art directors to broaden my search for work. And I certainly don't want to make any of the, I don't want to make any of the same mistakes I did before where work does not seem to be get more work. So I was hoping you all had some tips for any of us who are in this position. Thanks so much. All the best, Jonathan. All right, guys, what do you think is going on here? Do you, do you guys know any super illustrators who are always constantly turning down work because they're just so busy all the time? Busy. Um, yep. Yeah, that. That happens. Yeah. I, I do too. And the 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 thing with all of them are the, the thing they have in common is their work is just amazing to where the, their their agents can't, uh, I mean, there, there are clients fighting over working for them. And uh, I don't want to name names. I, I don't know why, but I, I'm thinking of a couple people in particular who, you know, they, they have to turn down work to be able to go on vacation. They... Mm-hmm. Um, they, they are constantly picking and choosing between jobs because they have to be really careful which ones they choose because when they get locked into a big project, 
there will always be other juicy things that come along. So they're always worried about, you know, missing I mean, out. Is, on, aren't, aren't we at that stage somewhat? I mean, I feel like. Yeah. And we've, we've turned out, we turned down a lot of stuff to work on SVS as well. It's almost um, everything. So, yeah. But, uh, and so whenever I see someone that says something like this, my first reaction is their work could probably get even better. They're probably good. They're probably yeah, really gonna, good. I'm going to send you a link to his Instagram in the chat. Okay. I don't think he wants us sharing it. He didn't say so in his message, but so you guys can get an idea. And here's what, here's what I think. His stuff is phenomenal, mm -hmm. but I look at it and I don't see children's book. Mm -hmm. If he wants to get a children's book or, or YA, I don't see um, stuff here that I would typically see on the cover of um, a young adult book or a middle grade book or in a children's book. And with comics, I see stuff that I wouldn't normally see in a comic. It's, it leans artsy. It leans fine art is what's mm -hmm. going on here. Mm -hmm. And so what, you know, my, my initial reaction here is you want to get work in comics. I think, I think you have to, be posting on your Instagram account a lot more. It doesn't have to be everybody else's style, but a little bit more mainstream. Still in your style, but mm -hmm. a little bit more mainstream. So you, you kind of have to give them, kind of give them a, a taste of what they could be having. So if I saw you doing some really cool X Men, like imagine an editor assigned you the cover to do like five or the, gave you an assignment to do five X-Men covers. Um, I would go do those X-Men covers and each cover showcase a different X-Men. And, and then I'm pretty sure they could, then they would be able to see, Oh, this is, this is just the kind of thing we would want for our particular project. But that mm -hmm. said, if it is in this style that you're doing, which is um, it's very, a lot of wet media, a energetic lot of like scratchy you know a lot of energy I mean, to, lines. to get to give viewers a, oh go ahead i'll let you describe it well, yeah it's just it's it's very artsy and it's not it's not slick like you kind of expect or want to see in a so automatically book. there's going to be fewer assignments that could be given to you mm -hmm. because it's a very specific style i disagree there i well i I guess I, I, I somewhat agree with that. Um, it will be specific, but I think the real problem is it hasn't been, it's not the style in the fact that it's how the media is being laid down or the kind of this looseness and combining a media and all this stuff. It's got a cool look. The problem is it just doesn't lean in any particular direction. So like if somebody asked me, hey, is this person a good artist? I'd say, absolutely. If they said, you know, where would this person's work exist? I can't even answer you. And I'm, and I'm, yeah. I'm in this industry. Like is, it doesn't, it's not necessarily gallery. It doesn't go on the wall. It doesn't go on in a, in a book. There's not a narrative. There's no text shown at all. So this person's like a good artist, but they just haven't leaned it in the right way. And I guess and it, sometimes analogies are a good way to describe this stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm remodeling a kitchen right now. So like, I'm just, I have cabinets and stuff like that on my brain. So my analogy that I instantly thought of is if I got two guys that knocked on my door, say I'm redoing this kitchen and one guy came to the door and he's like, I, I'm, I'm Mr. Cabinet Maker. And that's what his van says. And, you know, he's showing me all these portfolios of cabinets and I need some cabinets. Um, you know, look at his portfolio. And the next guy knocks on the door and he's like, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a woodworker. And he shows me like a harp that he designed and, and then, uh, you know, a block game or something out of wood things. He's like, no, I can do cabinets. I promise you I can do cabinets. I just don't have any to show you. I've got all this other weird wood sculpting. Which person would you hire? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, then, so that's yeah. sort of what this person's doing. He's like, okay, I can draw, but uh, he's hoping somebody sees it and says, okay, are you going to be able to draw my project? And I'm just going to hope that you can do it instead of mm -hmm. picking these people who are doing exactly what our art directors need them to. They've already seen kind of the context of those people's, those artists work. And they're like, yeah, this person does graphic novels. I mean, instantly when I see this person's work, I think of Dave McKeon's graphic novels it mm -hmm. looks almost exactly like it if you combined it with text and a narrative there is work there um a lot of work there probably i mean it's amazing and 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 i could see a lot of people being into that but just like this 
it just doesn't go anywhere. For, if the Instagram is being used as a portfolio, you have to ask, you're, you're asking for a really good art director that has a vision rather than you showing them your vision for them. So like, like graphic art, graphic designers, uh, art directors that are lower on the totem pole need to be led by the hand to using your work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's so like, it's one of those things where he's either, it, you know, there's, there's, if you've ever been surfing, this is why they use this all the time. Like you're ahead of the curve or ahead of the wave or catching the wave or you're behind the wave. And I'm looking at the style and I'm like, I can't tell if he's way ahead or way behind, but nothing, I, I don't see hardly anything being published in this style. And, and so like Will said, it, they have to be a visionary art director, somebody who's really looking for something that's, that's um, you know, that, that's, that's going to push the boundaries of what the medium can handle and what consumers can handle. So it's kind of one of those things. Happen, you, though. Yeah. Yeah. It's you either wait around and, and just take people at their word and say, I mean, you're obviously professional, you've done professional work. So I don't think it has anything to do, you know, I don't know if you're hard to work with or not, but it, I mean, your email sounds very agreeable. You seem like a, a stand up guy, but it really might be one of those things where we know where you're at and once something we know that fits this, we are absolutely going to call you. But if you want to be getting consistent, you know, monthly work in comics or, or, you know, a couple of projects every year from an art director for a children's book or a middle grade novel or something like that, I think you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to make something a little bit more for the masses. You know, I think we need to talk about the decision making process of what it's like for our hiring audience, not the artists, but the people hiring us, art directors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like we like, do you remember in the early days of the internet when everybody was making their first website and we, and everybody made it where, okay, you come in, there's a splash page. You gotta, you gotta chase a little animation around and then click it. <laughs> and then you go there and then it's, and then you're, it's, you don't know where to click still. You're like five clicks in and you're like, you're really trying to craft, there's music and you're trying to craft this right. experience. And the real rea the reality is people got one click. That's all they want to do. And they're bailing on that splash page because they don't even want yeah. it. They don't even want to click right. once um, if they're not getting what they want. And that's sort of how our buying audience is. We think, oh, I've, an art director is going to sit down and say, this work is interesting. How can I use this? But really they're saying, man, I got I got these 10 books I'm working on. They all have these due dates coming up. I need to hire this that thing out. Who's going to give me the guaranteed result? And that's more that's more like the decision making process. So you so I guess where I'm going with that is you want to make it easy on people. That's what happened with everyone's websites too when they realized those splash pages and all that were kicking people. People weren't following through. You make it as easy as possible. Put all the, a lot of visible work on the front page. Tell them exactly who you are and show what you're doing, um, and make it easy for your hiring uh, hiring audience and uh, whatever that means for you. You just need to make it simple. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing we'll, we'll close on this one is, um, you know, there hasn't been a lot of comics that you've done lately. Um, from what it looks like, I don't, you know, you said it was 2014 when you signed that deal and, and who knows how long that lasts, but that's seven years ago. And, um, I'm looking on your website and I'm not sure how new some of this independent stuff is. It looks, looks great. It's really cool. But one thing you might want to do is do a creator own thing or team up with a writer and go over to image and just tell yourself, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to try and get, um, do an image book, these independent books from image comics. I'm going to do an image book and sort of get me into comic shops again, or get me just kind of in the awareness, the consciousness of people. And what happens is, is you it's it's almost uh, like a, a calling card you know your 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 book that you've created shows that you're still professional you're still working you're making a thing and you're in the people's people's minds and it might lead to to more work or it might be so successful in and of itself that it um that you don't need to work for marvel or dc or, or some of these other companies but if, if comics is the thing you want to do i would you know i'd, I'd look look into that after 
making your style a little bit more mainstream. So I'm going to disagree with the mainstream. I just think you need to target who the audience is. I don't think you need to make this guy's really good. I know it's frustrating really probably for the audience to, to hear us talking about a visual. That's one of the fears we always had about this podcast is like, we well, start talking about one thing and you guys can't see it, but he's really good. I mean, I, really good. I would put him in the category in some ways of Mark Summers, who does scratchboard, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if you, so if you take Mark Summers, who just does black and white scratchboard, who's the best in the game. I mean, you could argue that, but he's at the top pretty much. Right. And then you, you compare him to um, anybody who uses, who's, who's equally as talented, equally as, as successful, but who uses color just on the fact that Mark Summers only does black and white and someone else does color. There's more opportunity out there for them because they mm -hmm. do black and white and color. Right. So that's how I look at this guy is he's his market is just smaller. The amount of jobs he would be up for because his style is so specific. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. All right. Next, next question. Okay. This is from Krish. How do I tell if an art school is good? Okay. As an 18 year old, soon to be high school graduate, I've considered, I've been considering a career in art for a while now and wanted to work in the art department in the animation industry. I've been looking for a good art education to instill discipline, gain connections and strengthen my skills in artists. Those are three very good reasons to go to art school, discipline, connections, and and craft mastery, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the point of looking for a good school, it all feels so overwhelming. I don't get where to uh, I don't get where to start or how to tell whether an art school or university has a good art program. Every website describes themselves as the best, but I can't tell which one is the right fit for a career in animation, art, and visual development. Love to hear what you guys think. Um, I'd love to hear you guys talk specifics and recommendations on both finding good school and actual programs to pick. Love your work so much. Thank you. What do you guys think there? Go I know what I'd do. I know what I'd do. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start this off. First step uh, I would be is look at um, your favorite artists. Reach out to them and just say, favorite artists who you know have graduated in the last five years. And just ask them, where'd you go to school? You know, uh, I want to be you in, in, let's see, if school's four, four years and they're, they graduated five years ago, you know, they're, t they're nine, 10 years ahead of you. So you just say, Hey, I want to be you in 10 years. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your path? And it could be a short email, title it, where'd you go to art school? And, and just say those words, I want to be you in 10 years. Tell me, tell me what you did, you know, where you went to school mm -hmm. and then let them, it makes it easy on them because they're busy, they're working, they've got you know, 40, 50 hour week of work plus social life if they're trying to remain balanced. So if they see one question that they can answer, they're more likely to answer it. Then here's my life story. Here's, you know, what I want to do. Here's my thing. Just get in, ask the question, get out and let them decide how much information they want to give you. So I would do that to 20 artists. You're going to get, you know, five that respond and there you'll get, you know, you'll get some that said, I didn't go to art school. Some that said, I went to this art school. Absolutely. This is what you got to do and everything in between. And that's, that's where I would go for there. What about you guys? It? <laughs> um, I would step one, make sure I agree with what Jake said, by the way, I think that's a good, good way to start. <clears throat> Just make sure the school is actually doing the thing that you want to do. I was always shocked mm -hmm. when I was teaching at a school that costs, you know, students ending up 100, 120K in debt. And then I'd ask them, you know, which, you know, as they get towards senior year, what are you going to do? And they're like, oh, I'm going to do uh, illustration even. Like at my school, it was animation and, and concept design. That's the department I taught in. We don't have it. We didn't have an illustration track. And we had a couple of classes, but they were way, or they wanted to do a children's book. Like it was not the school for mm -hmm. them. And they're mm -hmm. trying to shoehorn this education any way they can by meeting with teachers like me, who's doing different stuff. And, and, but that's just not a great way to approach an education. I think it's, I think it's find the school that does the thing that you want to do the best. 
Mm-hmm. And then work back from there. You know, you start out with the, the best school ever. Well, maybe that school's 150K and it's in New York and you can't move. Okay, what's the, the next school down and the next school down? You know what I mean? You find that kind of perfect balance for whatever your situation is. But start with the work you want to do. And that sort of leans where Jake was saying too, is if you pick these artists that you think are great, follow them. They're going to recommend a school probably that facilitates that job that they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's another thing here too, and that is two things. One, not everyone I think is uh, is right for art school, so that that would be a question I would ask: is how do you know that your um, that art school is the answer versus taking classes online? And um, I don't know if you guys want to go into that a little bit, but the other thing is um, some some art schools just as a warning. There are there's there's one I can't, I won't mention the name but but there's a there it's a it's a chain of art schools that has a really bad reputation with a lot of graduates that have that have seen the light after they get out and spend all the money and one of the things that they do is they they use celebrities um, in their in their uh, admissions brochures to attract people I'm sure you guys know who I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't you say the name? Uh-uh. You could, I mean, you could save someone from going to it. Yeah, but the, but uh, I think we legally that's um, it could yeah, be, a be careful there. You could say, "Here's an art school that you should look into," but know this: everyone I've talked to have gone to it said they didn't like going to it. Yeah, but I'd uh, be careful. I with actually that know one. some teachers that are really good. Um, that have taught there too. It's just, it's super expensive. And um, there's you gotta, you gotta be careful. I guess to to add to what the struggle that we're having right now, some schools within a, like I taught at one of the, at a chain school. I don't know if it's the one you're even talking about, but our school was so high functioning. And yet there's other ones under the exact same name that were had a 0% placement rate. Mm. Mm. So but, hmm. which experience are you going to get? And so you really do have yeah. to, if it's going to be a chain, you better research those teachers. Yeah. I mean, they better be working in the field. There's, there's another thing that, that, that happens with these high priced art schools in general, just as a warning. And that is, um, say you, you start off and you don't finish and, um, you, you know, you don't end up working in the field. Well, they actually benefit from the fact that a lot of people that don't end up working in their field are embarrassed that they couldn't do it, you know, cause there are students that they get out and, and have careers in illustration that they go on to thrive. Yeah. So the ones that aren't serviced, the ones that feel let down, the ones that feel like they didn't get a good education, they really kind of just kind of crawl under a rock and go into some other field and don't really talk about it much. Um, it's mm. because it's, it's looked at as, well, you just weren't good enough. No, sometimes it's not that at all. Sometimes there really are schools out there that just take your money and don't really give you the kind of, I mean, it's crazy when, when you think about art school, I mean, we're going down this road. We were talking the other day on pricing what we do at svslearn.com versus art school. Mm-hmm. And if you broke down every interaction with your teachers, the one-on-ones, at art school and had a dollar sign based on dividing up your tuition. You know, let's say you're Mm -hmm. 15 or $20,000 a semester. It could possibly be that, you know, you look at a a conversation you had with a teacher that was very valuable, but maybe you only have five of those while you're there. (laughs) And so you look at the price tag on those interactions and sometimes they're worth it. Sometimes if you end up with a career, a really good career, you can say, well, it was totally worth it. Um, at other times you might think not, I actually think it really depends on the student more than anything else, because I needed an art school. I don't know. I don't know that I would have done. Okay. I really learned from my peers in art school Mm -hmm. because I have, I auditorially, I don't listen well. I, I don't, I don't learn auditorially. I learn, I'm a visual learner. So I relied on my students to like explain the assignments to me, (laughs) you know? (laughs) You know, I don't know. Right. I don't know how I would have. I mean, the internet wasn't a thing when I went to school. So I don't know how. Well, that's what I was going to add is it's, it's changed a lot. I can't, I can't in good conscience recommend 
a degreed art program anymore. I hate to say that in such a definitive way, but I really feel that way that there's so many options online. And I'm not just talking about our school. Um, there's there's just so many. And, and, and mm-hmm. most of the ones that are out there are run by, you know, we were just talking about find the teacher that you want. I mean, or, or the industry that you want, make sure it's serviced by the school. Well, sometimes you're getting the best people in the industry. Um, even some of our competition, I highly recommend them. I think they're fantastic. And mm-hmm. and it's cheap as a comparison, like what Will's saying, it's a fraction of the cost and nobody cares about the degree anymore. I just don't understand. In our, if you're going to be a doctor, don't try, don't, don't try to skip the, the, the medical degree, but right. we're not no doctors. It's just life if you do a bad drawing. <laughs> right, right. Just a little bit of your soul dies. They could but, lose um, a limb. <laughs> they could have a limb so, that's too big. I, I like what he says in his question. He He's looking for a good art education to instill discipline, gain connections, and strengthen his skills. And the the trade-off when you don't go to art school is, is you nothing instills discipline. It really does have to come from within. There's no peer Mm -hmm. pressure. There's no teacher pressure. There's no parental pressure. Maybe there is parental pressure if you're learning from home, but essentially you, you, you lose all this pressure and it really has to come from within. So you you have to know that about yourself. Mm -hmm. If you are a person who needs outside pressure, then probably should be in a program. And the second thing is gain connections and you're going to have to do something to gain connections if you if you go the homeschool or the you know learn on your own route and that means maybe some of your school budget is going to conventions going to workshops going to um you know artist meetups things like that spending some time in in you know hot spots where artists live and work and, you know, maybe you spend a summer in um, L.A. as an intern and you try to get that that internship or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are some things you're going to have to, like, balance against not going to art school. Because I think what's cool is if you find a school that has a very high caliber faculty, very high caliber student body, and you insert yourself in there, you're going to learn the skills, you're going to gain the connections, and you're going to have a lot of that um, discipline kind of, you know, forced upon you. Right. But again, you have to weigh that against the costs and maybe there's a cheaper way to do that. Maybe you only go for two years and you learn online the rest of the time, or maybe, you know, maybe you're part-time there and you're part-time doing homeschooling or something. I don't know. Let me, let me add something too that Mm -hmm. I think a lot of students don't understand um, in general is that so you'll hear often, oh, um, I didn't like that teacher because they have their pets. And if you're not one of them, then you don't get any uh, attention from the teacher. Mm-hmm. And over, with all my teaching, what I've come to realize is most teachers don't want to have a, a click in the class. They don't want to just arbitrarily eliminate students. What, what mm-hmm. ends up happening is that as a teacher – you are inspired and you are excited to get up and go to work when you have students that work hard. And, mm-hmm. and so when I, in the letter, you know, if you're looking for motivation, that might, may, might not be the, the right way to, um, to think about it. Because like Jake said, the motivation has to come from you. You have to bring it because then the teachers will get excited about you because they'll see how hard you're working and they, you want to help someone that's in motion and when you see someone that's not in motion, when you, as a teacher, when you see someone that's, that's not striving and not working hard, you just, all you can think of is like, why are you even here? Mm-hmm. You're, you're just taking up a spot that someone else could have. So as a teacher, I would, I would have uh, my students come up and show me the work that they did that day or, or the work they were supposed to turn in that day. And I'd have some students that would bring up the same thing that I critiqued two days ago or three days ago, whenever we had class left. But they're 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 feeling like if I don't if I don't come up and show you, then you'll think that I'm not doing anything by just sitting in my seat and not showing you something. So I'm going to show you the same thing that I showed you two days ago, and maybe you'll think that I'm trying because I'm here talking and saying words, and all I'm thinking the whole time is this person <laughs> didn't do a dang thing, and they're wasting my time and everyone else's, and I'm like, 
and and finally, you know, I I I started to get a little more bold, and I'm like, so is there anything different from the last time? No. Okay. Well, then go go work, man. You know, like go yeah. do your thing, and and it just leaves me with this impression that that they're not like I don't know what you've been doing in your life, but you haven't been working, and you do start to get a. a you know, it's, you do start to form an impression about your students of who the hard workers are and who the the, the lazy ones are. And it, and, it, and the interesting thing is it, it almost always plays out through the whole semester. And you end up spending more time with the, with the people that work hard. Mm-hmm. You just do. And, I, mm-hmm. and you're just, I, there's nothing that I can say to motivate a student. There's nothing that I can really do. I could say, let's have a great Let's have a great semester this year, guys. Okay, go to it on my first day, but that's right. about it. <laughs> right, right. So it does have to come from, you know, at some point from within. But uh, the other thing too, like I, I worked at an animation studio for several years, a couple of them, and there would be people who were working there as a production assistant. And essentially you have a production manager who manages a department and they aren't artists what they are are very organized left brain people who make sure everybody's keeping a schedule and they're going to meetings, making sure, you know, um, Joe is doing what he said he would do. And Sarah is doing, you know, delivering what she said she would deliver on time and everybody's, you know, working like that. And they have assistants who, who help them out with that. And they, you know, interface one-on-one with these. And so what I would see is oftentimes these production assistants, a few of them, they were on that track to becoming a production manager, but some of them just wanted to become uh, in the art department, a modeler, uh, a lighter. They wanted to work as an artist in one of these departments. And so essentially they were, they were, they may not have even gone to school for that, but they knew if they could learn on the side and spend their day hours working at this job, they would get the connections they would need. They would even get feedback on some of the stuff that they were working on at home. And then they would also be, you know, first, first pick um, or, or at least know when the job opens up and they could submit their portfolio when it was ready. And I knew a guy who went from production assistant to, like a full on modeler working at blue sky studios and doing a dang good job modeling. And that was sort of his way of getting into the industry. It wasn't through school, but he got that discipline. He got those connections and he got the skills that he needed. And that might be a way to do it too. You know, it might be that you do a year or two of school and then you get your foot in at an entry level position where you want to work and, and work your way, up that way too so there's there's like um you know there isn't one path there's just this map there's just this landscape and there's like a hundred different ways to get from point a to point b just depends like do you are you good at swimming well if not avoid the river over there and instead you're going to want to hike this cliff are you good at hiking okay you're going to take the cliff route (laughs) you know um Maybe you have wings. You're just going to fly right over everything and, and perch right on top of that peak. <laughs> That's a good I can point. keep going with this. this analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're like a little snake and you burrow in the <laughs> ground and you just dig underneath everything. <laughs> snakes don't burrow, do they? <laughs> don't snakes have holes like a snake? snake uh, hole? Do they make their holes? Do they go in other people's holes? I mean, other animals' holes. <laughs> <laughs> other people's holes. I don't know. Um Okay, next question. Are we ready for that? Yeah. Did we? Oh well, no, no. I'm wondering question? about. I'm wondering about snakes now. Hold on. Can Go I look it up. <laughs> Go look it up while we're talking. Do, do snakes burrow? Okay, Natalie is- asks. Um, she says in the title, "A question about time." Hey guys, I've done your courses on and off for the past few years, and I've loved your podcast from the first episode. So she's a she's an OG, three uh, PP fan. That's cool. This question is pretty specific, but I'm always curious. I'd love to hear in depth about how much time you take on a picture book project and specifics about how much time goes in into each stage and how much time it took you when you started out, I guess, versus now. I'm illustrating my fourth picture books. That's awesome. Congratulations. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Number four. 
and I've worked for weeks to get the characters, layout, and rough sketches done. In one of your picture book classes, Jake drew out that Little Red Riding Hood dummy in what seemed like seconds, so I'm wondering if I'm extraordinarily slow. <laughs> Thanks for the wisdom and all the hours you've kept me company in the studio. Smiley face, Natalie. Well, okay, Will. we are wait, all wait, slow. Wait, 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 one, one second, one second. Snakes travel along the ground. Most do not burrow, and they use existing holes created by chipmunks, mice, and other small mammals. Okay. Win. So, win. That wasn't a competition. A total win. So you guys see uh, Beat Will and Jake? Okay, go ahead. So maybe, maybe you're a chipmunk, and you're good at jumping from branch to branch, but also burrowing. <laughs> so in this scenario, you're going you're gonna to find that path. And then if you are a snake, you're just going to use the holes other people have dug. <laughs> We're all trying to all get right. to that peak. All right. So moving on to Natalie's question. I was uh, going to say, was, listen, we're all slow compared to Jake. So he makes everybody look bad. That's just something that you have to, you just have to learn who you are in life. It's kind of like, uh, what's that? What was that uh, movie with the, with the, with the Samuel L. Jackson is the, mm, the bad the guy. No, no, no. He's the bad Pulp, guy. Pulp Fiction. No. Oh. He's oh. he's uh, Mr. Glass. Captain Marvel. He's Mr. Glass. Oh, oh. Unbreakable. Oh. Unbreakable. I can never remember the name of that movie. Sorry. Remember, when, he's, remember, remember when he says, uh, it's 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 so so great find, finally figuring out why you're here. Uh -huh. Well, we can all feel great knowing that we're never going to be as fast as Jake. Here's the thing, though. I've been thinking. Last night I was like, I was having all this introspection. And I was looking at the children's books I've done because I was going through preparing that one lecture for the children's book pro mm -hmm. course. And I have like two books I'm really proud of. <laughs> and the rest of them, I'm like, <laughs> you should have slowed down and just taken a little bit more time and like, you know, feel the same worked way. On, worked on we this. We all feel the same. I think everybody feels well, the same. Well, me and Jake are putting together a lecture. We were talking about like the one thing that putting some of these lectures together has done is make us feel terrible about ourselves <laughs> because, <laughs> because so many people are so, so good. So good. So here's yeah. the thing though. I, I've listened to two different Caldecott award winners answer this question. Like mm -hmm. how many, how long does it take you to do a book? I can't remember the name of the first one, but the second one was Eric Roman. And, um, and uh, both of them said, Oh, I, uh, I would never, ever want to work on more than one book a year. Now, mm -hmm. as sitting there as an illustrator who is trying to make a living with my children's mm -hmm. books and needing to do two or three a year as mm -hmm. part of my other freelance work to to cobble together a, a decent income. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, this was like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I, I wouldn't say the word wasn't offended at their answer, but it, but the feeling I had was, well, you've won the Caldecott, which means you make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Your books will stay in print for life. You'll receive royalties from that from those books. And every publisher wants to work with you because you're a Caldecott winner. So you ha you you know what I mean? Like, I mean, and and to just really quick in a nutshell, when you win the Caldecott, um, you can sell anywhere from overnight. I mean, there's there's like a uh, hundred and ten thousand libraries in the U.S., and they all pretty much have to buy multiple copies of your book. So you're selling hundreds of thousands of books, and that's just to libraries. That's not to individual families. And if you do the math with a five or well, usually it's a ten percent royalty because it's usually author illustrator. There's there's just tons of money coming in, and they can afford to mull over. I mean, I saw Eric Roman. I went to his house one time and, and he was working on his next book. And he was like, right now I'm experimenting with mediums to decide what medium to do my next book in. I'm trying to find <laughs> a new style. And so I've been spending the last two months just experimenting. And I say good for him. That is That would be an amazing place to be in, to be able to afford to spend that kind of time. I've never had that kind of time. In fact, mm -hmm. when I get a contract, they usually say, um, so we're still, the author's still ding donging around with the story and we'll probably have you a manuscript sometime next month, but we're just checking to see if you can have it done in, you know, and it's usually five or six months from then. 
you know. I just want to interject here. I shared a, a studio with Will for a couple of years. The reason he doesn't have that kind of time is because he cuts out of work at noon every day <laughs> and he's either hiking, <laughs> snowboarding, or racquetball. <laughs> I I do I do have time for myself. But but you paid your dues already. But, I mean, well, you, that hasn't yeah. always been that way. But no, you, but what you're what we're talking about here is the the considerations. So Jake, I would yeah. say you and both both you and I, and probably Lee, we we make we make some considerations for each page, and you know, as mm-hmm. we're making the dummy, we'll make substitutions and we'll pull illustrations and change them, and then we'll send them to our art director, and then they'll have changes. But I don't exhaust. I don't have time to exhaust every possibility to right. reduce down to right. the best. A, a lot of times it's it's a management of of compromises mm-hmm. on each page, you know. Mm-hmm. So So how know. long does it take you to do a children's book? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so we've so, been so, talking so, for 20 minutes, we haven't answered anything. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> um I can dummy out a book in usually pretty easily in a week or two. Mm-hmm. Work it in. And have it mm-hmm. dummied in a week or two, and then explain what a dummy is. It's a it's basically a mock up of your book with just sketches, and the sketches are for me are still in the rough stage, but they're they're ironed out to where the text fits in there. I've figured out um, my value um, composition mm-hmm. so that I I know um, I know that it'll work mm-hmm. if I illustrate those pages, but then. You know, and then from there, the art director and editor are going to have at it, and they're, they're going to change a bunch of things and ask for um, changes. And then um, I need probably two to three months to mm-hmm. finish rendering the book, and that's quick. That's on the quick side. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Lee, what about you? Um, I, I I work quick, and then and then in in kind of. St- stops and starts like will was saying there's all these different steps that you're forced to like take a break from it so it adds to the time when you're right you know the, the clock's going but you're actually not doing anything so mm. to break my to break those steps down for me a dummy is a week to get just a clumsy kind of dummy together and then another maybe two to three weeks to draw it up to a level that I would submit to my clients. So like a month to get a, a month to a month and a half to get a book ready for the first submission. Uh, and then it's gone for a little while that it comes back. And, and so, so, you know, just taking into account each one of those phases, including the paint phase, I'd say it takes me about four months of me doing something. And then however long it takes for the, you know, my clients to get back to me. And sometimes that's a long time. Yeah. But about four months, four months of 40 hour week work yeah no and so for me yeah. i was going to answer that no it's not it there's that's including the time of the back and forth and waiting to hear back on i mean on my last book and this is going in my my lecture for the children's book pro class mm-hmm. for on dummies is they gave me a manuscript and they needed me to get going and i i was missing text for three spreads in one page <laughs> so they were changing the text but they're like we need you to get going <laughs> because we don't want to burn through your time. And I wanted to get going because I needed to work it yeah. into my schedule. But I'm working around three pages and I don't know what the text is going to say. Four, three yeah. and a half pages. You know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. so you're waiting. You, you have this time waiting. So the fastest I've ever done a children's book was was painting. Back when I was painting, not digital, was, was 28 days. I had, from the Whoa. time they gave me approval, I had 28 days to lay out transfer all my drawings onto paper, texture that paper or seal the paper, texture it, underpaint it and paint each one of those. And so I made a detailed schedule for myself that included, it was, I worked 24, I worked more than 24 seven. I mean, I, can you work more than 24 seven? I guess not. I, I <laughs> only took time out to sleep and to go for a walk each day for my back, you know? Yeah. And I was in the chair painting and was sick of that book by the time that was the three little gators how how much days. did you get paid for that is that too much to ask no that contract i believe was a fifteen thousand dollar book so, so that's a good a month but but you didn't live that month you you just worked i just worked yeah yeah um do you guys think good. it's fair this is a contract question but do you guys think it's fair 
for illustrators to put into their contract that you basically outline how long you're going to take. But then there's an asterisk in there that says, if you don't get back to me by, you know, with it, like, you know, six weeks after turning in a dummy, the, the deadline has to be extended because what happens is the, the art directors or the publisher will sit on something right. for months sometimes, not get back to you, but your deadline is not moving. And then they finally get back to you and you have this super compressed amount of time to finish what would have normally and been they just a normal want it amount anyway. of time. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and, reason, and a lot of times. Yeah, I was going to say the reason for that is they're doing 10 books at the same time or something. But not only that, they're in trouble if they don't get their books done and yeah. take them to the meeting in time and it makes them look bad even though they might have been the one that didn't get back to you because right. they had to leave work early on a friday and then on monday they took off on vacation and so now they now finally get the, back and bench. i think you, it should be a con it either the date moves or your rate changes based on the compression of the illustrator's time yeah, yeah. i think for me doing a children's book the, the fastest i ever knocked out a, a dummy like starting it started it pdf emailed was like 12 hours and um and i don't ever want to do that again you wait you did what in 12 hours a, a book dummy the whole thing the whole thing wow yeah. let me guess and, that that's not one of your you favorite ones are you bragging <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is a brag but but so i i that was one of those things where it was like, um, uh, you know, I was in the zone and I could see like the future and the past at the same time. And I was like, nobody talked to me. It's like the matrix. <laughs> yeah, All the numbers like, are falling out of the sky. I had neglected this. And I was like, oh shoot. I told him I would, I'd turn it in tomorrow. So, so I'm like, I have to do it. And I have to do it now. Uh, typically though, I like that working on it for a week and, and I've done books where I've, that dummy has taken a month to do where it's like do the first pass, get notes, fix some things, do a second pass, you know, three or four passes until it's finally like locked in. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then the actual rendering, I'm, I'm kind of the same place you guys are um, with, with how long it takes, you know, three months, maybe um, spread out over nine months, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, but you'll work in book. another job in there too. Like if somebody called up and had a juicy little mm -hmm. get in, get out job, you'll throw that in, under there, want right? Oh yeah, in the absolutely. I'll the tell time. you this: almost every book that I do, I saw. It does not matter how everything unfolds in terms of the, all the process, the dummies and the revisions and all that stuff. It comes down to at the end, I have to do a painting a day. It, mm. it never fails. And every time <laughs> yeah. I, I hate it. And cause you can't change it. You can't revise it. You just, you really do have to plow forward and finish these things. And each time I'm done, I'm like, next time I'm going to have like, you know, four days per painting. That's going to be what I'm going to do. And then the next book comes around. It's one day per painting. Here we go again. Gotta 30 days, here we go. 30 <laughs> paintings. Here we go. It's so, it's so, fr it's so frustrating, it's but I will add this, that we're, so we're teaching the children's book pro class and we're still making videos for it. Even though the students have already started, we're, we're packing this thing full and our, we had an idea to do each me, Will and Jake to do the same manuscript. Just, we're, we just picked the three little pigs and we're just doing, I think, uh, you know, up to around 10 pages of it. We're not doing the right. full dummy. The, the purpose and, uh, there was to, to show you that three different illustrators can do the same manuscript and come up with three different approaches to how this would happen just you know instead of showing one example here's here's three little pigs like here's three different people doing it so it's super yeah, and cool. you can you can see where the overlap is and there's a lot of overlap um despite where we end up eventually for the finish there's a lot of overlap uh and there's there's some differences too but um the point that i was going to make is like you know early on i'd try to jump and finish that stage because there's always this kind of uncomfortability when you don't know what you're going to do. And, and I, I try to live in that little moment now of being uncomfortable and not being finished because I love the concepting stage of it and, and, and playing around with stuff and not saying, okay, I'm making the dummy right now. And even, even in, I'm, I'm sketching this actually while we're talking and I'm coming up with ideas that I never thought I would add to, to mm -hmm. a manuscript just because I'm playing, I'm not working yet. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and I just think it's real important to stay in that role. So sometimes that can extend 
I want it to extend the beginning phases of these books so the books are better and that the books are more creative uh, and, and more uh, narratively interesting. Um, so I don't know. I, I think a lot of times we get on the path of how long to take you. Oh, it took me an hour. Oh, it took me 30 minutes. Ha ha. You know, and it's like it's mm -hmm. faster, the better. And I'm actually saying the opposite. I'd almost like everything to slow down, make yeah. things that are good and that you're proud of later. Cause they're like, like Jake said, there's some of the books that I look at and I'm like, man, I could have done better. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if that speed was self-imposed. It may have been like, Oh, I just want to show how good I am. I want to show how fast I am, but I, I, I didn't, I didn't accomplish yeah. that. I think cause I rushed. Yeah. Do, do you guys, we have time for one short one, one more short sure. one, then we can go. Okay. This one is from Tier, Turi. I think it's Turi. How often should I update my Wacom to a new one? Okay. Mm. First of all, thank you for your show. Listening to you has truly supported my path to becoming a full-time illustrator here in Germany. Hmm. Uh, I have a question about the hardware for digital art. I purchased a Wacom C Cintiq in 2016, and it has been one of the best decisions for my career. Absolutely, I'm right there with you. My Cintiq has served me well with no issues, but lately I've been wondering whether I should switch to the latest Cintiq model or stick to my old one until it breaks down. Technology advances so quickly, and I'm afraid that I might that I might be missing out on some technical improvements, such as color accuracy or performance. When doing digital art, how often should I update my hardware? As these tools can be very expensive, how long do you think is their typical life cycle for a Cintiq? Thanks in advance for your insight and sorry for any typos. Mm. All right. That's a good, it's, guys... a, it's a good question. My, the, yeah. the Cintiq I'm using now is actually made of stone. It was made 100 years ago. <laughs> it has two pixels. <laughs> <laughs> Everything looks like an Atari uh, drawing. Um, anyway, <laughs> It's it lasts a long time. I think I think that particular brand gets a little bit longer of a window. But I'm going to go mm -hmm. ahead and throw it out five to seven years. I would think about changing your gear. I'm I'm yeah. right there with my with all my stuff, and I'm kind of bumming on it because I it all works okay, and I'm sort of wondering the same thing mm -hmm. that that she is. It's but I think I think a good indicators five to seven years but i do think the cintiq tablets last longer because there's not necessarily a processor that goes with them and i don't care how much pressure sensitivity they keep saying because they keep up in what that is oh it's ten thousand levels i don't mm -hmm. know i was okay when it was 512 or whatever i, I don't yeah. know the difference that much <laughs> i mine i got mine used it's a 21 ux they don't even make it they don't make this size anymore mm -hmm. um I don't, I don't, I think it was two or three years old when I got it, um, from a, from a colleague at the, at the university. And so I got it in 2012. It's over 10 years old mm -hmm. and, um, there's not, a, there's no pixels out. There's nothing wrong with it. And I've, I've looked at some of those really nice wide ones, you know, with the, the really nice, uh, mounting arms where you can move it around and yeah. bring it down in your lap. And I've been tempted but um, I'm I'm someone who has really really begun to value um, investing money, and I look at that money and I go, I just don't need it. Mm -hmm. You know, I I, mm -hmm. I hated the stand that came with it because it put me at an awkward angle. Um, right. Even though it was adjustable, it wasn't adjustable enough. Right. And so I've I've I um um got a hack. Uh, on on my desk where i set it to the right angle mm -hmm. and uh i prop it up and it just works it propped my... up on like books and a tennis racket <laughs> yeah. old shoe <laughs> <laughs> pretty much um, I, I mean you can't you can't be a technology chaser i i, I agree with what will what will say in there i mean if you the reason i don't want to get the new computer is because I hate doing that research because it all of a sudden sucks you in like, oh, you think the A12 processor was good. The A15 yeah. is like 10 times faster. And you know, meanwhile, I'm working on a 10 right. year old machine that's been right. fine. Mm, right. <laughs> I will say this with Cintiqs, they either work great and will last forever or you just get a bum one that like uh -huh. craps out. I've, ne I've never heard of that. Um, I, it, it happens so infrequently where I, I, where someone has to replace a Cintiq. So mm -hmm. I, I would say like I had a, the model right before Will's and it lasted me like 12 years. And the only reason I had to get rid of it was because um, 
the 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 software on my computer didn't support that Cintiq anymore, and I had to get it. <laughs> and so I was I had an old computer running the oldest software so that I could use my Cintiq. And finally, I was like, I got to. I got to update everything because I can't use the latest Photoshop. I can't use the, you know, anything. So I got a new machine. I got a new Cintiq and now I'm probably good for, you know, another five years. 50 years. Yeah. I, I remember my, you. My, my Cintiq cracked all the way around. There's a circle crack oh, around really? the whole screen. Yeah. But from my left hand, I'm right-handed, but I was just, I mean, I was slightly leaning on it, but I think there was like a little void underneath it mm-hmm. and just my hand sitting on top it made a little crack like in your car windshield and then yeah. all of a sudden every time i come out there it worked its way around but my drawing area which is you know i have a 27 inch um cintiq but my drawing area is probably five inches wide amazing. <laughs> that, that and that's what i draw in all the time so do you still <laughs> use that one yeah yeah i mean i tried to send it at 800 bucks to fix the glass i said nope i'll, I'll draw with the crack yeah i i my suspicion is that they used to make them better than they do now. Okay, so I have some inside information on that. You ready Tell for this? Tell me, yeah. Remember when we went to Adobe Max a few years uh-huh. ago? So uh, Cintiq had a booth there, and I was talking with one of the, the or not, it's not, Wacom. it's Wacom. Wacom had a booth there. And don't say Wacom. Demo. Say Wacom or you offend the Wacom people. It sound, Wacom sounds so much better. It's it does, the worst. but... It's the worst name. Yeah. And don't get me started on their logo. I cannot stand <laughs> the stupid logo. I'm glad that they're like dialing back and just going with like the, the word mark, Wacom. But that weird cone thing. Yeah. I, sorry. I don't complain very often about stuff like that. But I got to look and see. Yeah, I can't, I can't I remember to. what it is. But uh... anyways, they were saying it's been a real problem that they made such good products um, that essentially everyone who bought a Cintiq has bought a Cintiq and they're not they're buying dying. new ones because the Cintiqs that they have work fine. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. So they need planned obsolescence, right? Isn't that the exactly. term for that? If they're going to, and gonna that's what, selling. that's what I worry about in replacing this one is that they're going to give me something that'll crack in a circle all the way around it. Yeah. So who knows, who knows, but I would say just as a rule, budget out, like save, you know, 200 bucks a year and every, or 300 or uh, do the math, but save enough every year so that you have um, a little, like a little account that you can devote to buying new equipment every five years, something like that, you know. That's a good idea. And even if you don't buy it every five years, at least you have that money set aside if, if something does break, you know. Okay, I think that's it for today. Are we good? You guys good? Good. All right, I'll take us out. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Three Point Perspective. This is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Um, I want to talk about Children's Book Pro, too. Um, it's not available right now, but we will be running it again um, in the fall, I believe. So go to childrensbookpro.com to sign up, to get notified. If you want to be a part of that, we've been getting a ton of good feedback on this. Can course. I, can I, re- can I read a review real quick yeah, go just ahead for our, review. for audience? Well, I got to, I didn't plan on this. So I got to scroll through our hun- me and Will and Jake send each other 5,000 text <laughs> messages a day. <laughs> I'm really not is. kidding. It's, it's, it's a lot. And so, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to find anything because it just like our podcast, it bounces all over the place. Maybe I'm um, not even gonna... A good third of those messages are, where's Will? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he said he'd be here. <laughs> or where's right, okay. Lee? He's on a bike ride. Okay. Right. No, it's not where's Lee. Although yesterday I was in, I was in the attic <laughs> with an infrared camera. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, some wrong one. Never mind. What a, what a, what a letdown. I can't find just, this that review uh, that I was sending you guys yesterday because it was such it was hip. such a great review. It said, <laughs> say, it said, I'll paraphrase. Lee, you're better than Will and Jake. <laughs> you're awesome. No, no. What it said was, I've been I've been in university for like two or three years, and basically one class of ours has launched so far. And she's this is true. You guys can yeah, back me up on this. Week, said I, one week I, into it. One weekend, one class into it, she said, I've learned more in this one class than I have the entire time 
during my university experience. And um, she's just so thankful that we're actually giving out real information. And I was talking to my wife about it. I was like, you know, some of these other organizations that teach book illustration have set the bar so low that when we're getting giving like actual information, they're like, oh my God, somebody's actually talking about real information. So it's been, right. it's been amazing to so far. The, re the results have been, the reviews have been great. Cool. So go sign up to be notified when we launch this again, childrensbookpro.com. All right. Um, let's see who, oh, this is, I'm totally like lost where I was at. <laughs> it's been brought to you by svslearn.com where Becoming a Great Illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, Jake Parker. Go find Will on Instagram. It's Will Terry um, Art, at Will Terry Art. And his website is willterry.com. Lee is over on Instagram. You can follow him at Lee White um, Illo. And his website is leewhiteillustration.com. And I'm over on Instagram. It's at Jake Parker. And my website is jakeparkerart.com. Uh, special thanks to Daniel, too, who is the producer on this um, on this podcast. So check him out. It's daniel2.co. T is spelled, or two is spelled T-U. Uh, special thanks to David Broad, who's the, or David Bro, sorry. <laughs> French, French name. David well, Bro, I knew one who, of us was going to do that. Yeah. And uh, he, because I'm reading it in my mind. You, can you guys do that where you close your eyes and you actually read words? Jake, them? I would never make that mistake. How could you possibly make that mistake? I know. I know. Okay. So anyways, <laughs> he is our... Um, He's our production manager guy at SVS Learn. So shout out to him. Thank you for that. Um, and then lastly, Lisa, Lisa, uh, Lisa Fott. <laughs> Just like we're struggling. This is this is after like four hours of video filming. We've so. recorded so much today. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> All right, everybody, go leave a comment on the forum and uh, and that's it for today. Bye, guys. See you next time. <laughs> Bye.